Welcome to Impact the Conversation, a podcast of the University of Minnesota's Institute on Community Integration that brings you strategies and stories advancing the inclusion of people with disabilities. Our guests are the authors of Impact, our long-running magazine that bridges the research to practice gap with professional and personal reflections on what matters most in disability equity today. I'm your host, Janet Stewart. Do you know someone with disabilities who also struggles with addiction? Then the latest issue of Impact is for you. Articles break down the current research into what we know about the intersection of disability and addiction and what we need to do as a field to create better treatment options. Today I'm talking with Nathan Perry, someone with disabilities who's in recovery. Nathan served as an editor for this impact issue, and he also wrote a very personal story about his addiction and recovery. He's joined in the studio today by his brother Brad and his sister-in-law, Amy Hewitt. Dr. Hewitt is also the director of the Institute on Community Integration, which publishes Impact. Welcome to all of you, and thank you for being here today. Nathan, you share in your article about how addiction came into your life and how, after several attempts, um, you have stayed sober for eight years. And congratulations on that, by the way. Thank you. Can you share with us just very briefly a little about how you first knew that this was something that was going to be a battle in your life and and then a little bit about the recovery? Well, I think that... Um, as I stated earlier, um, when I, uh, was first seeking treatment, um, for, um, addiction, I wasn't taking it seriously. I, uh, still in my mind thought that I had it under control and went through the emotions, um, Like when, um, you know, my drug and alcohol counselor asked me, you know, if if I drank at all, I said, nope, when the night before I drank, you know. Um, And it took uh, four treatments to to get it under control. Um, When I got to the third treatment, I started realizing that Maybe I do have a problem, but still went through the motions. And then during the fourth treatment, I accepted that, yeah, I do have a serious issue and that I had to take it seriously and uh, make it work for my health and for uh, living with the family and everything. Now, what you talked about is very similar to what everyone in recovery talks about. It, it's very common for anyone who is in recovery to have relapses. So that's no different with or without disabilities. Are there, But are there things that you think would have been more helpful um, if you had had access to them, something that was a little more informed about disability? Well... Going through my addiction and everything, I felt that I I felt kind of alone and isolated. Um, Even though I wasn't alone and isolated, it still felt that way uh, because I still did not completely understand the mechanisms of addiction and was dealing with uh, some rather serious uh, personal problems. And with having a disability like autism, which I have, it can be very daunting and not understanding everything that is happening. Um, Luckily, I had Brad and Amy um, to help uh, steer me but still, it was a real battle because, you know, I felt that um, that I was alone, even though I wasn't alone. 
Um, so a deeper understanding maybe of the actual steps to go through the recovery process, but then also addressing the other issues like loneliness, for example, would, mm -hmm. have, would have been helpful. Yeah. And then you also served as, a, as an editor for this issue. And when we were talking about what we wanted this issue to be, you mentioned something that no one else did. And I was really impressed by that. But the idea of better aftercare, once someone is on the road to recovery, has, is not in active addiction, suffering um, active addiction right at the moment, the idea of following up with care long after uh, the recovery process starts. What what do you think is, what would you have wanted in that realm? Well, when I was going through uh, recovery, uh, going through treatment, um, one thing I noticed and I did talk about uh, with my counselors is that there really was no aftercare. You go in, you go through treatment, and then pretty much you're on your own. Uh, it's up to you to make connections on how to continue that. Um, I did use AA and everything. Uh, but a lot of people that I have talked to also did not have really a firm path of where to go afterwards. Um, so um, I did go, I did have uh, success in AA. I was there for five years or so, going uh, once a week to a neighborhood uh, AA meeting, um, you know, then COVID hit. And then it just kind of fell off the track because uh, they don't do it in person anymore. Um, one of the things that um, I did learn and I have to keep a real close eye on is, um, environment and triggers and stuff like that. So I kind of had, I kind of made my own toolkit on how to um, deal with this. Whatever happens, I cannot drink. My body won't tolerate it. My family won't tolerate it. Uh, so I have to seek other supports when I get upset. Amy, you've spent your career uh, dedicated to the self-determination and inclusion of people with disabilities in their communities and things like dignity of risk are things that you believe in very staunchly. In your article, you talk about wanting to preserve that as you, as you work with Nathan and try to support him in this recovery process. That can be really difficult to 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 actually, you know, to say it is one thing to live it is tough when you've got somebody going through addiction. Um, I, you know, you talk about this in your article, but can you just sum up a little bit about how you did that and how you were able to preserve things like dignity of risk and and preserve choices even when your tendency might have been to, um, protect Nathan and not let anything, you know, not let anyone in or not let anyone be involved with him anymore. <laughs> what what kind of went through your mind with that? It, it's always challenging. And I, I think your statement was right on. Like it's, it's easy to conceptualize and to have all these theories, but when it's you and your family's being affected, that's that's harder to sort out. It's easier to advocate for a full group of people. But one of the things we know is being person-centered is critical in this field. And that means the person, wherever they are and in whatever context they're in. And so for us, it's just a constant balance of here are the things Nathan wants to do or is doing. And letting him experience those natural consequences. And in in the case of his addiction, eventually it, it became we were a natural consequence. And his ability to live with us became 
a natural consequence because we just couldn't have that exposure with our children anymore. It had gotten too far, gone too far. And so it is, it's just that constant. I, we could talk about a number of issues where it's important for Nathan to be able to make his own decisions and we need to be there to support him, but not to the extent that he can do whatever he wants that's going to affect us or our family. So I, it, it's hard. You know, I am eight years sober, but I feel incredibly guilty about what I expose my family to, and in particularly the kids. And I'm quite angry at myself for doing that. I wasn't involved in their lives a lot of times when they were younger and everything, and I resent it. Um, you know, and, you know, just <laughs> there isn't kind of a day that goes by to where I kind of have a thought or two. It's just like, oh, my God, why did I do this? You know. <laughs> um, so forgiving yourself is hard, right? Forgiving myself is hard. I have not completely done that yet. It's just going to take time. But I have real regrets about what it put everybody through. And the addiction didn't just hit at home. Nathan was working here at ICI during this time. Earlier, Nathan and I spoke with Mark Olson, Nathan's supervisor. My main, uh, main focus at that point was Nathan's health. And so, yes, there were, there were work-related pieces that I needed to make sure were still being met. But I tried to lead with, with the grace that could be led with. And, and support Nathan to, to, you know, find his path that would work where he was dealing with his addiction and also getting his work done. So it was, you know, there was a balancing act involved. And, and I want to I go back, Nathan, and just, you know, even before you came to me with the diagnosis, I knew something was going on. How did you know that, Mark? Well, there, I mean, Nathan, Nathan, some of the things that, that would happen is you would have some of that anger that would come out here in the office. I mean, we, we had instances where we had to talk about those things, you know, and, and, you know, oftentimes we could talk through it, you know, and there was an increase in time that you needed out of me to support you through that at those times. But then the, the real indicator for me was if Nathan had a bad night the night before, he would show up and you could tell in his face, you could tell in how he was taking care of himself, and that you were a little bit unkempt. And Mark, how was it for you as, a, as an employer? That can be a tough road to walk. You're an employer, you're a friend, you want to, to support Nathan at this time so much, and yet, too, the work has to get done. And you know, all the things that come with that. What was that like for you? It, it, it had its balancing act. It, it became more difficult for me as Nathan's supervisor to get the focus where it needed to be. In the end, for Nathan, family support made all the difference. Brad, how's this been for you? Are you, um, you know, Nathan looks up to you and Amy so much for all that the two of you have done to include him in the family and provide, you know, family leadership um, and all of that with, with Amy. Um, any thoughts kind of going through your mind about what you think really worked um, or maybe what didn't? Uh, well, I'll, I'll just comment on one of the things Nathan just said a moment ago about the feeling bad and feeling guilty, and he does. Um but when I hear Nathan talk about that, I have real concrete things that I say to him that he can do for the family that if he, you know, that would be helpful. That isn't just like it's tangible things that he can that he can do so he doesn't just like dwell on feeling guilty, which kind of falls on us when he does that. We experience that. Nathan's, you know, in a bad mood because he's feeling bad about himself. So that affects our family that way. So I like to redirect it to something like, this would be really helpful, something concrete that That's he can great. do for the family. So. That's great. And so do you think that 
builds everybody up when you and can you kind of make light of it and make some jokes uh, yeah, it's, out it's of it? It's definitely light of it because Nathan doesn't always want to do those things. Yeah. <laughs> so <that's well. laughs> yeah. If you're feeling bad enough, maybe you will. You take the so, trash out, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, that kind okay. of thing. Yeah. Okay. I, yeah. I, I, that's great, actually, because yeah. then and and then everyone's participating, right? Yeah. What a great idea. One of the things, you know, that, you know, both Amos and Jack are adults now. And I really want to um, spend some alone time with them and talk to them. Um, get to know them better. Um, Amos and I are repairing our relationship. Um, Amos had just about had it. Um, and so, um, it, it's going to take time. Uh, one thing that, you know, it, like I said, Amos and Jack are adults. They have their own places and everything. It's just, I would love to like spend a weekend with them and show them that we can have fun and everything and don't have to worry about, oh God, what's next or that sort of stuff. And I feel that, you know, they're always on guard. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm trying to navigate that on my own. Um, and I know that's not easy. No, it's not. It's not easy. Yeah, It's that'd not be, easy. That'd be tough. Amy, just with your work hat on now for a second, your policy hat, in the issue, we talk a lot about the research, um, the intersection of addiction and disability, and we talk about some promising programs that are working in this area. But is there something from a policy standpoint that we can, or more of a systemic level that we should be looking at as a field? I think what happens is we have these silos. We have mental health and substance abuse disorder in a silo, and we have developmental disabilities in a silo. And any time you're trying to get government agencies to come together with policy or to come together with services, it's hard. And even with mental health. So if you think about Nathan, he has an intellectual and developmental disability. He has a number of mental health diagnoses, and he has substance abuse um, and is in recovery. So those are all different systems, totally different systems. And trying to get those systems to come together, most mental health professionals aren't really trained to work with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Most people who work in the intellectual and developmental disability field know nothing about substance abuse disorder or bipolar disorder or any number of things. So it's really about coming together as entities that deliver services and trying to create policy and trying to create specialists that can cross over all of these siloed categorical groups of people who have needs that that they need support for. And, and that's hard. We're super lucky in the Twin Cities area because we have very concrete, available, accessible uh, substance abuse disorder providers who specialize in supports to people with developmental disabilities and autism. And I think across the country or even across the state of Minnesota, those services just aren't available to people. So as hard as it was for us, we could wrap a lot of support and services around Nathan. So it's not just the substance abuse services that he needed, but he also needed mental health counseling and he needed his um, supports for medication and decisions around medication. And we, we had all that for him as well as his day-to-day -day direct support professional staff that are there to help him um, and who stood by him in really, really, really challenging times um, where he, he would become very upset and then take that out on his staff um, in kind of rage is the word I would use. Yeah, um, I would agree. I would concur. And his staff would, that would be their time together, would be just him, 
mm-hmm. yelling at them and being all angry and mad. But Did they, any of them leave? No, they all stuck with him. I think part of it is Nathan was mad about a circumstance. And so blaming other people and taking it out on other people was a pattern for a long time. And it took him realizing, this is my issue, and I've got to accept the responsibility for it. It's not every, anybody else's fault. It's, it's, you know, the cards he was dealt genetically because there's a strong family history of substance abuse disorder mm-hmm. on his side of the family. And he had to accept that. Mm-hmm. And once he kind of could do that, um, things came around. But the other thing is it is common for people to go through treatment Many times, I mean, you as you said, you hear that from a lot of people who, who go through treatment. I think the difference is conceptually, it's hard for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities to even understand it. I think of the twelve-step program in AA; that's pretty theoretical, mm-hmm. and it's it's very hard. And yeah, Nathan did go to AA, but. There were a lot of fits and starts with that and a lot of different sponsors and long periods of time where he wouldn't have a sponsor or he'd get a sponsor and then they'd sort of realize, oh, he has a disability and then they would just not respond to him and he'd have to start all over. That brings up a point I wanted to ask you about because in putting the issue together, we did hear from from people both uh, writing personal stories and from some people in the field that adapting some of this treatment isn't as maybe difficult as what some substance abuse providers have sort of made it out to be. They sort of throw up their hands and say, we don't have people trained in this area, so we don't offer the service. And and folks on the IDD side sort of said, well, that's not good enough. You know, we have people who really need these services. Is it is that just an excuse or it's bias? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just bias and not wanting to change the way we've always done things so that it works for all people. It's no different than what you do to try to make content so that people with intellectual disabilities can understand it. Mm-hmm. Sort of a similar similar concept that. We, you have to adapt things so that they work for people who have different needs, and that just doesn't doesn't happen. And we, if you think about, just think about the shortage of mental health professionals in general, substance abuse disorder professionals in general, and then we're asking on top of it to find people who can help support people with intellectual disabilities who also have a substance abuse disorder. I loved at the end of your article when you talked about some of the lessons learned um, and self-preservation being one of them. How do you how did you do that in your own in your own family? How did you make sure that the two of you were okay, your kids were okay? Any any tips or things that that as you think back to the toughest times really helped in self-preservation? I think we did a lot of switching off. I was just gonna say tag team. Tag team, yeah. So one person was you know, doing what they needed to do to renew themselves. Um, and the other person would be on, you know, <laughs> dealing with what was going on. I um, mean, sometimes it was sometimes 24 was hours yeah, up, too. just making sure he was yeah. okay and dealing with police and ambulances. And if we both were doing that at the frequency that it was required, yeah, we would have been there for each other, but we would have burned out long before one before we did. So we always tag team and we've shared that with other families who have kids with complex needs to trade off, trade off. You both Mm -hmm. don't have to be on all the time. And we would kind of make that almost official. Like this is your time. (laughs) (laughs) Isn't it your time? Right. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, and I would ask you too, if you want to any wrap up thoughts, but you know, I guess I just wondered what you would say to someone with disabilities who thinks um, either they or a family member might have a, an issue with addiction, where, where, where would you tell them to start? Well, there's two things. Um, one, um, they would need to properly get assessed because um, there's 
all sorts of labels and all sorts of programs that um, can help. So it's very important to um, find out what the what the needs are for the individual um, and to match them up with the best services possible. One of the things that uh, was found out is that one of my problems is I had um, emotional mood dysregulation, and that kind of needed to be worked on before dealt with the treatment process. Um, so getting that assessment and everything done and a talk to a uh, therapist on top of a drug counselor is vital for both of them to communicate to, f to find out exactly what the individual needs. It hasn't been mentioned, and I don't think it's, you know, very popular in this country, but you want to look at all the tools that you have available and resources to, and one of the things that was really helpful with Nathan and for our family was, uh, was an abuse. Um, and that really, at times when he was at his worst, that was what kept him on the, on the straight and narrow, um, of being able to live in our home still. And Nathan's done great work with AA and counseling and, and all that. But I, there were times with the impulse control that if there was a really bad day, all that could be out the window. And that's when the abuse, you know, kept really him from, yeah, from drinking. So yeah, I don't know if you want to say any more about that. Yeah, Nathan. I will. Um, I've been on abuse for Long time. A long time, eight years since the last relapse. And I do at times, in fact, today was one of them, that I was like, man, I really would like to talk to Brad and Amy about getting off of abuse. I've been eight years sober. But part of me was like, yeah, but if things were to hit just <laughs> just right and I did was not on that, it would be kind of tempting to drink. So I'm like, yeah, leave it alone, just leave Nathan. it alone. So <laughs> it's, it's still a tool that's working. Yes. Yeah. I would add, we didn't hide any of this from people. No. That, that's, a, that's a tip for other families. It's so common for people to hide their problems and we we weren't willing to do that for Nathan. We weren't going to hide that he was struggling and that it was affecting us. And so it really opens communication and opens expectations. So we never hid it from our kids. You couldn't hide it. You know, it's, no, it's very it's I think all the neighbors knew they heard it. So <laughs> but it still, you can you can act like <laughs> yeah. you're in denial, and yeah. and that and yeah. that you chose not to do, and and that really actually brings me to wanting to thank all three of you for the candor that you showed in putting these articles together for our readers, um, both you serving as an issue editor and writing your story gave us the opportunity to put together a magazine and then to go out and find other people with the expectation that they would share uh, some difficult stories as well. And they did. And we didn't have a single author request, you know, not using their name. Um, and we didn't want to create that as, a, as an expectation in the magazine because we wanted to say, this is not something to hide away and be embarrassed about. This is this is something to share and to show leadership in, and and you've done that, all three of you in your own way. So and there's I, really yeah. no reason if you think about it. People have substance abuse disorder, so why would anybody think that people with intellectual and developmental disabilities don't also mm -hmm. have the same risks, the same opportunities, and the same issues? So. Exactly. It's, people need to know it's it's real and it happens and you can work through it. I think one of the worst things to do to an individual um, is for a family to hide it and ignore it because it just it doesn't go away. It just gets worse. And with my issue, it was impossible to hide. The entire neighborhood heard me, you know, when I would 
go off and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I don't even quite know how to describe that exactly. I'm not so. going to describe it because it's too graphic, <laughs> but it just, you know, it needs to be brought out into the open and it needs to be brought out into the open respectfully and not to be used as or seen as shame or a weakness. That's very, very important. And I, you know, what recovery's done for Nathan is it's brought back his laughter. He's very funny, and humor is a way that we've always gotten along and survived mm -hmm. as a family. But when he was actively using, there was no laughter. There was no humor. It was no. all anger. He and... was not Otis from the Andy Griffith show, the happy <laughs> town drunk at all. No. <laughs> that, wasn't, that wasn't Nathan. But I think that's, it's nice to see the humor back. That's great. It's nice to hear that from you. Still, there's a hell of a lot of, lot of work to, to continue, you know, but I think I've made pretty significant progress. So, and I always have to keep my guard up, always. <music>